So thanks, everybody, for coming out to the third, final, last um, exciting Stephen Weiss design dialogue. Um, we've had, a, I think, a pretty magnificent trip so far with our first two, and I think tonight we'll only, um, uh, we'll only get better. So I'm really excited. I've been really looking forward to this one, um, and I'm hoping some real uh, sparks will fly. Um, it's been my, my name, by the way, my name is Jay Merhunt. I'm the um, uh, director of the brand new graduate program in transdisciplinary design here at Parsons. Um, and I've also been very uh, fortunate and privileged to be able to help coordinate this uh, Stephen Weiss lecture series for 2010. Um, the Stephen Weiss Visiting Lectureship in the Journal of Design and Management um, was initiated in 2002 and was dedicated to Donna Karen's late husband, Stephen Weiss. Uh, the intention was to bring innovative design and business thinkers here to Parsons through the design and management program. This has, as Parsons has changed, the mandate of this has changed, um, and we now, now design and management fits within the School of Design Strategies, um, and we've been able to, I think, really significantly expand the reach of the Stephen Weiss Lectureship, as well as the journal. Um, we do, though, remain deeply grateful to Donna Karen and the Karen Weiss Foundation for the continued support of this program at Parsons and for the opportunity to honor Stephen's legacy through these evolving and I think really thought-provoking dialogues. Um, I don't believe David Bressman and Corey Weiss are here tonight, but if they are, again, welcome and thank you. Um, this also, as uh, those of you who have been to these events know, this um, lecture series is also kind of marking the inauguration of the graduate program in transdisciplinary design, um, brand new at Parsons. And it's been a really exciting few weeks. We've had a number of events um, that have gone on, including this lecture series and the uh, symposium called uh, Headspace on Santa's Design, um, and both of which have gotten a lot of great press and publicity. And I think there's a real hunger out there um, for programming like this, for a program like this, um, that really tries to address at some uh, really different level the kind of um, complex, seemingly intractable and insolvable problems that we face that design um, continues to struggle with and continues, I think, to sometimes come up a bit short when it's constrained by disciplinary practice. So we've had a chance through this lecture series to bring in um, a wide range of, I think, really uh, innovative thinkers. And um, it's just been, uh, I have to say, completely gratifying um, to also see the turnout that's um, been for each of these, because I think it, again, shows that there's real demand out there. Um, we've also had a great um, group of applicants to the program, and we're really excited to enroll our first class in the fall of 2010. And that's when life's really going to get exciting, particularly for me. Um, I also have the great privilege of introducing two people that I know well. Um, and. Uh, it's a, um, for those of you who have certain conspiracy theories about Australians taking over Parsons, um, tonight's not going to help as we've got two more to add to the roster, um, at least of speakers and not necessarily faculty. Um, and what I'm going to do actually, I, I had the opportunity one time previously to butcher um, Nigel's biography. And I usually try not to read people's biography, um, but instead do a nice gloss on them. However, this time I'm reading it so I can get it right. So um, Nigel Snow is the technical evangelist and product manager with the Microsoft Public Safety Initiative, otherwise known as MicrosoftVine.net. Prior to joining the Vine team, Nigel led Microsoft's research on humanitarian collaboration, working in Afghanistan and elsewhere, designing and testing innovative collaboration technologies to make communities more resilient and development more effective. He is an advisor to the ICT for Peace Foundation and the Institute for State Effectiveness. Um, before joining Microsoft, Nigel worked for the United Nations, most recently as Global Pandemic Contingency Planner for the UN system. That's a person you want to know. When there's a global pandemic, you want someone who kind of knows how to respond. So I'm keeping him close by. Um, and before that, with the UN Joint Logistics Center, where he was deployed to Iraq, the 2004 tsunami in Indonesia, the Sudan, and a number of other crises. And he has just recently returned from three weeks in Haiti. Uh, at the UNJLC, he managed mapping information and management teams and led logistics coordination in the field for major emergencies. Um, he has one of my favorite PhDs in complex adaptive systems from the Australian National University and he's worked as a researcher, graphic designer, lobbyist, founded technology startups, received a number of patents, jumped off way too many cliffs over the years. My, um, 
My take when I really first met him and got a chance to introduce him was that he, given this biography, he had to be a spy. So I put it to him. I said, you know, like at some point, haven't you been some international man of mystery or something like that? And he said, well, no, but with his bio, he probably should have been. Um, so I think you'll enjoy having a uh, top flight secret agent here tonight. Um, after Nigel, we'll have a presentation by Natalie Jeremijenko, um, who is currently Associate Professor of Visual Art at NYU and directs the X-Design Environmental Health Clinic. Uh, previously, she was on the Visual Arts faculty at the University of California, San Diego, and the Faculty of Engineering at Yale. Um, and her work, uh, diverse and provocative, has been included in the Whitney Biennial of 2006, as well as the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Di Design Triennial of 2006 and 7, and lots of other prestigious uh, art and design exhibitions. Um, it is, uh, one of the things that I really love about having Natalie here is that um, all of us kind of live uh, to some extent under the mantra that uh, design is about solving problems. And what Natalie's work reminds us is that design can also cause problems. Um, and I think that's the best part of it, that design not only solves things, but can also provoke us to struggle uh, with the things we make and the things we build and the things we live with. And I think her work is exemplary of um, a kind of um, wonderful messiness um, that reflects and counters with some of the deep uh, complexities of our everyday uh, messy world. Um, she has been named, amongst other things, one of MIT Technology Review's top 100 young innovators. Um, and uh, you know, once you, with Natalie, sort of once you see her, you won't forget her. So we're really, um, I'm really excited for tonight. I think this is going to be two um, really uh, extravagant presentations, and I think the the spaces between them will be equally interesting. Um, and then. Uh, we will, after the two presentations, we'll have a discussion up here and hopefully some time for all of you to ask some questions. So I will turn it over right now to Nigel Snowd and he will take us on the next journey. Thank you, Jaima. Um, where am I? That's really the question. So, after a rather fulsome introduction like that, I'm a bit embarrassed because really what I am is a sort of art school dropout and design wannabe. And find myself in the place where uh, I'm privileged enough to help co-teach a, a course here at Parsons on design for the Red Cross, which is really a joy working with students. I'm doing amazing things. And for all the wannabe spy background, really what it is, is trying to sort of get practical down and dirty with a bunch of really hard problems all over the world. And uh, it's more about finding more problems every time you pick up a stone than doing anything to solve them in the end. So Jamie came to me and said, here's what we'd like you to talk about. Um, great. I know nothing about that, really, because I'm not a designer playing in any of these spaces. So uh, all I can do is give you a slightly different viewpoint, which is the fact that I spent a lot of time trying to think about what complexity means. And really looking at social systems and saying, well, uh, how are all these things here? Complex and are there any similarities that we can have a look at? So my immediate answer was, yeah, of course. No problem, of course there's a role. What the hell is you asking me for? And then you went on to ask, well, what about collaborations and alliances? And you work for Microsoft, so you must be involved in partnerships. I mean, that's all we do, it seems, at Microsoft sometimes. Um, and how do we build into these services? And my immediate thought was, well, of course, again, uh, it's happening at all levels. There's McKinsey-style advisories on how to do this, and there's IDEO design-style work where design thinking is coming to practice. But the place I play in in my day job, um, which is working for Microsoft, is really about what tools do we give people to make a difference themselves. And coming back to my earlier research and the practical work that we each live, which is about what is it about emerging self-organizing changes and movements that can make something really happen. And there's a reason why I think that matters particularly right now, at this point in time, at this point in society, that that is one of our only strategies to make a difference. Um, perhaps I'm biased because I think that's the only way I think or that's the only way I think I can make a difference. And that's complex adaptive systems, which is a mean and nasty word that makes you all wonder how the heck can design play a role in that um, and I'm really glad I'm up here first giving the boring presentation because otherwise coming after Natalie would be a, a terrible place to be. 
because um, she's got even just the sneak peek in the side, lots of interesting pictures. But my interesting picture is this one, which is um, this is the place where design meets these social systems, these complex interacting systems. There's a lot of other places where it meets, I should say. But for me, this is where I start to interact with it, which is that we have this phenomenal range of services, products. These are internet technology products, of course, each of which is designed at some level, some of which more so than others when you try and use them. Right? Each of which has an incredible set of knock-on effects in a complex and interesting and emergent way. And all of which is starting to play a role, an increasing role in how we do social service delivery, healthcare delivery, and what we mean by communities and government. So what do I do? Uh, the formal job description, never mind what Jamer said about being a spy, um, is that I research and design and implement societal networking systems. And this is something that my crew has come up with as a term of art. It's a bit ridiculous sometimes. But trying to contrast social networking systems, which is about individuals interacting with each other, which is complex enough. Lots of interesting things come out of that. <laughs> to how those systems interact with this beast that we call society. And that means including things like organizations, governments, community groups, as first-class entities, as actors, because they play a role. I mean, the Department of Social Services, uh, healthcare, hospitals, schools interact with you uh, as individuals, of course, but they're entities. I mean, they're legal entities as well, and that makes a big difference. So trying to figure out ways we include that in these rich social networks that already exist and flourish. Because if you want to design for change, you have to think about how those actors play. That's a different viewpoint from how they might have been designed 20 years ago for trying to implement change. And my other thing is I research that I implement societal networking systems, which is shorthand for me now, because I think about it in the same way, finally, probably brought the two together, as I work on international humanitarian response and preparedness. It's a different flip side of the coin. I like to think they're related, but sometimes my boss doesn't think so. So just a contrast, standard systems models which I probably think about in the context of a lot of design as well. We think about cause and effect, um, parts revealing the whole, rational choice, they're knowable, we can explore them, uh, we can find solutions to things. We have a problem, we have a scope, we have a client, if you want to put it that way. And ultimately, they're soluble in some sense. We have a problem, we can find a solution, we can map, we can put a boundary around it, say, here you go. Here is how you should do healthcare reform. Good luck. I don't think it fits in this box very well anymore. Perhaps 50 years ago, a bunch of great wizards like John von Neumann, a uh, system thinker, said I could map out how this is going to work. Marshall and the Marshall Plan said we can figure out how Europe's going to work. Interesting comparison, perhaps. When you look at the sort of mythology of how the Marshall Plan affected Europe after World War II, it is that there was a grand plan cooked up in a back room somewhere with a bit of consultation and Marshall said, here is, I'm a great economist or planner with my big think tank team and this is how we're going to fix things. And miraculously things went to plan. The answer is, it was nothing at all like that. It was all trial and error, it was just try something, all that didn't work. Different money was thrown to different groups, it was all contingent. It flowed and it developed. So, Probably a strong argument is to say we've been designing for these systems all of our lives and the lives of our four forebears. We just talk about it slightly differently now. We've got different tools and different language, which is a really useful thing. So in the extreme case for emergency response, perhaps, this is a search and rescue team. Uh, this is how you might think of doing search and rescue uh, in an organized way, in a soluble way. It's a controllable number of people. You can imagine the parts, people knowing their roles, delivering on what they promised, coming to agreements on what to do next, defining an outcome you'd like. You might map it in this kind of a way. This is of, you know, everyone hates to think about uh, systems designers thinking this way. Um, but I've met, as of you, I'm sure, many engineers who actually think that this is how things happen, whereas this is how things happen, right? This is the real world. Um, forget the content. Um, if you ever tried to map any process you've really been involved in, of any complexity, um, that has a bunch of different parts, you know that it's all like this. Right? So the hard part is what strategies and approaches do we have to attack it? I'd add another layer, which is the concept that, I won't say just now, every generation think this, thinks they're special, but there's an element of the speed of change 
that is going on now that is causing a lot of problems with our ability to design solutions or the systems, social systems, all kinds of systems to adapt. And it is just that speed of change, that adaptability, the strength of the linkages. If a network is built, uh, is, is sort of defined by the kinds of linkages you have and the speed at which those linkages change, how memes and ideas can travel, effectively how quickly you can imagine controlling it or mapping it or understanding it, then we're in a place not only where are there more and more bridges being built between different individuals, between different parts of the system, but they're also changing far quicker than ever before, being broken down and rebuilt. So our ability to map, control, predict outcomes, et cetera, is going to the dogs, so to speak. This is healthcare. Well, this is one view on healthcare. This is the people who think that the plan's too complex. Uh, this is actually probably just a massive simplification, if only they'd said so, of how things really are. It's also the time static view on things, just to go back to that former point, right? How on earth do we design a set of outcomes for any individual, let alone a system as a whole? Um, I'm asking a lot of problems. It's just something I look at all the time where I'm doing humanitarian response in a place where every single time I go on an international response, there's different actors, different individuals. Some of the individuals are the same, which is nice. It's the only way things work. Uh, every situation is different. Every group of people are different. There's almost completely different roles and responsibilities. And we make it up as we go along. I'm deeply dissatisfied with that, which is why I said the second part of my, my job description was trying to put some order into thinking about how we do this. And slowly we're making a difference. And Haiti, for instance, has actually crystallized a lot of new thinking, finally, um, in the back rooms of trying to get international humanitarian response working better. And people are talking about complexity there, finally. People are starting to break down the feeling that we can map and design an aid or development program that will deliver a set of services or outcomes for a set of individuals in some country over there as labeled as beneficiaries. Right? Um, Realizing it is actually complex, that everybody's a part of the system in the outcomes. That there might be some tools to help us figure out how to do this better. That's exactly the state of the art at the moment in international aid and development thinking on this one. So there's a long way to go. I'd like to contrast three systems. A puzzle, follow a recipe. Repeatable, you got the instructions, almost anyone can do it. It helps to have a bit of expertise. You know how much salt to add, perhaps, rather than just following precisely the, the, the guide for dummies. A complicated problem, rocket to the moon. Despite all the challenges, there's a high degree of certainty of the outcome, at least when you get a fair way down the process. You've tested a few systems. More particularly, if you have the recipe book, so to speak, you can, in theory, follow it again. Massive infrastructure required, lots of expertise required, lots of diversity of skills, but repeatable. And as a new father, I have to say, raising a kid doesn't fit in any of those things at all. Right? Um, it's, I think it's a really illustrative example because we can have all the what to do with your toddler's first year manuals you like, but every outcome's completely different. Right? And sort of takes a village to raise a child. It's all those interactions as well as all the interactions going on inside. So there's a bunch of boundary problems that matter for any complex system in trying to design the outcome for raising a mensch as a kid, basically. A friend of mine just wrote a book on how to raise a mensch. And I haven't read it yet, but I'm intrigued to think exactly what her formulas are. To come to, this is a slide I just gave, a couple of slides I've stolen from a talk I just gave to the chiefs of police or the major Canadian uh, cities, where they're engaged with the problem of how on earth do they work with their communities? How do they community, do community policing in the age of Twitter? How do they do community policing in the age of terrorism when they don't quite know who their communities are anymore? So they all know this, but the, the challenge is that in any response, their audience, their constituents, is massively complex. It's no longer working with a local small community who you could either get to know or at least define in some heterogeneous, sorry, homogeneous way. As responses scale, as problems get more complex, they don't just get sort of linearly more complex, they get massively more complex. Right? The number of actors taking part get involved and the ability to coordinate completely disappears. International aid is a, for instance, is not run by the military where you could actually predict coordination and being able to say that about the military as a 
example is interesting if you've ever worked with the military who claim themselves to never be able to coordinate anything really. But then they look at this other system over here and go, how on earth does that ever work? And it's quite interesting because you'll find most military officers working with international humanitarian aid and development actors will initially or for quite some time or forever say, you have no idea what you're doing, it's a complete mess, let me take over. I'll put some order into this. And those who've been around for a while will often sit and go, actually, despite the complete lack of order and what I see as chaos, things still happen. They might not be what I define as efficient. Question one, flag, what is efficient anyway? Right? Um, but somehow you seem to be able to figure out together how to get things done, which is the property of an emergent system. And my final slide to the chiefs of police is basically the fact that life is really complex as a citizen because not only do you live with all these government agencies, I'm talking about citizens facing their agencies, their communities. Right? You don't live in this simple world of small neighbours, which is how most services are designed, unfortunately. Um, is that not only do you have in one jurisdiction, let's just back up slightly, right? one jurisdiction, uh, all these different contact points for your agencies. You actually live in multiple places at once, where your parents live, where you work, where you travel, just by ad hoc chance. So you don't actually know what social systems you're interacting with. So it gets hard. So the challenge is, how do they reach out to everybody? I think there's some interesting solutions, and most of which involve new technologies like Facebook and other, uh, other social networking processes. But basically, complex systems that we care about in terms of designing for a difference involve all these kind of problems. None of which are really open to doing a nice constrained design solution, I might add. Right. So we've got to think a little bit differently. I think there'll be more of that coming after me. Um, and I come at this, fortunately or unfortunately, the fact that I was a scientist for many years working on complex adaptive systems at the same time as I was trying to do other things. And uh, trying to predict them, trying to control them, and trying to tell everybody, including myself, that that actually wasn't possible. Um, but I think there are some strategies, and I come at the emergence from simple rules and the interconnectedness and interdependence. Part of it is about defining a boundary, understanding your system well enough to know whether or not there are strong ties or weak ties. Because, for instance, the global foreign exchange system, really strongly connected. What happens over here massively affects over here. Financial system, financial crisis. Things that happen over here come over here. But the boundaries between educational institutions, for instance, a student operating in Parsons isn't really affected very easily by what happens at NYU or what happens in a student in Australia. Though within Parsons, there's a lot of strong connections. Right? Facebook might have shattered that somewhat um, between students to each other. But it's really important to start thinking about those boundary issues and where you define the rules and uh, what feedback process is there, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is a quote I like. I've unfortunately lost who gave the quote, which is an appalling piece of research, um, which is that design has never been a closed off, uh, in reality, a closed off problem. And what I'd argue in the work that I do uh, at Microsoft, trying to design social network solutions and trying to figure out how we work with other social network systems, the battle that I have every day is basically trying to convince our product developers to not build the thing. Right? Service design, if you like, is like this, whereby I don't want you to build me a solution. I want you to build something and work with me as we evolve this over time. I want it out there. I want people to react to it. I want to listen to what they say. I want them to do things that surprise me, but that let us sense and understand how to change and evolve and adapt. It's not a cycle that will ever end. There is no closed end to this. There's no boundary to this system, this engagement. Right? It's always continuously being aware. Fortunately, design has some great tools for helping with this. Right? There's mapping and visualization, just to be the most blunt, simple visual design approach. Right? We can't understand a system at all until we can map it, see it lots of different ways, have it challenge us in lots of different ways and challenge our thinking. No one else has those tools, and they're critical, even more critical than they ever were. 
Um, it's not just simple visual design, there's the complex interactive design. This is what I really like about risks and interconnections. Talk about open systems. And, you know, there's a bunch of service design challenges that mostly happen by accident. I mentioned it just already, what I do day to day. I mean, no one thought that Twitter would be this big, right? I don't imagine that any of those initiators thought they could possibly be like this. And they certainly didn't engineer it for that. If anyone knows how Twitter got started on uh, Ruby on Rails and the software they use and everything else, they had massive system crashes. They still do occasionally. Right? So they were completely surprised. I mean, in business, you want to be surprised by the positive upside. Right? You don't want to be surprised by the negative downside, but no one hears about those folks. Right? Um, so they can't have possibly designed for you know, 25 or 130 million users, I think, they've got now. Right? So it was about being adaptive. It was about saying, uh, being flexible. They didn't design for Twitter to be used in the way it was. Hashtags came along, geolocation came along. People, it turned from being something you stayed in touch with your close friends to being the premier way for public announcements to go out from cities and other agencies. Completely different set of use cases. Um, sort of design and technology basically play a massive role in reconceiving social services. This is just a bit of a throwaway slide, but basically saying there's a bunch of different ways we can visualize and use and enable and empower people by thinking about using data in different ways and different kinds of services. And even to the extent of actually, I mean, I, I work a lot, as I said, with governments and trying to talk to them about how three-on-one isn't the be-all and end-all of interacting with your community. There are other ways to do this. This is my little short list uh, that I work on with, with people. I really like the sensing aspect because if we don't design solutions that are capable of understanding how they're being used, we won't learn from them. We won't learn how to adapt them. If they're not adaptable in the first place, you, you're stuffed as well, of course, right? Um, revelatory is probably a better way of saying, a worse way of saying discoverable. Um, the people can find them, understand them, grasp them. There are affordances in the product design sense. And human scaled, because it is actually in the end about us making connections and people acting. Um, I'm trying to get over the sense that we can design from the top, we design from the bottom, or experience from the bottom up basically. As I said, mapping and analysis, we can't understand what we're doing or change it unless we can visualize it, unless we can analyze it, unless we know how to do that better. They're all design skills. Simulation play our exploratory techniques. They're critical in this. Right? We don't figure out what's happening unless we're simulating. Right? We don't know where things can go unless we run. And it's no longer the realm of scientists stuck in a lab with a big supercomputer trying to figure out how things might be. It's actually, there are tools and techniques available to all of us. And as I said, solutions of individuals that reach to the social. I really love the fact that finally economists have got for the game and realized that they actually have a role to play in this, that they are the people who wield the influence about uh, how influence can be measured and pushed around. This is actually a quote uh, that I really like. Um, Most economists haven't even got here. Would you believe I saw this quote just recently in a manual for the United, Kate, United Kingdom military about how they can influence operations in Afghanistan. So the military has had this process for many years, it actually came out of the US Air Force, called effects-based operations, whereby they would design, they would have an outcome they wanted to have, an effect, um, and they would do this in huge cascading system model, cascading set of cause and effect to say, if we only do these things, it will happen this way. Massive set of analysis. Uh, came out of Cold War era nuclear strike analysis, actually, would you believe? But started to be applied in Iraq um, in 2003. Finally, some people have got out of that phase and said, actually, we can't operate that way, which is kind of refreshing to see. Um, I'm yet to see the outcomes. Um, and as I said, this is the... Uh, I won't even bother to go into here. I've already talked about societal networking. And I'll finish by saying the following, which is something we all realize. And this is Al Gore in his office. Um, my office looks a little bit like that, unfortunately. Or fortunately. Is that uh, Don Norman sort of made the point very strongly that the chaos and complexity you see in another situation is just my ordering system. 
We've each got our own maps, our own processes for understanding knowledge, uh, for organizing our world. And uh, just because it looks like a complex system, there's two questions you have to ask is, does it actually, is there really an underlying simplicity in order to it that I can make use of or that the owner has? And the second one may well be that, is it as complex as it needs to be? You look at the, you look at the flight cockpit of an airplane. That thing can't be any simpler. Right? It just takes skills, time, and expertise to learn. And so often we confuse those two things with true chaos. And so I'd ask you all to sort of look at that and think about it whenever you try and design or encounter such situations. I'll end there. Thank you for a marvelous uh, precursor uh, introduction to all the important ideas that I'd like to touch on. I'd like to do it from the point of view of uh, my work and lab and the kind of way that I framed the problem of complex adapter systems or just figuring out what to do. Uh, really, that's the kind of uh, AKA of the crisis that I think we're all facing, which um, as designers, as participants in a participatory democracy uh, in the face of shared collective uncertain threat in the face of climate crisis and climate destabilization. I think we ask ourselves what to do, right? Um, so I think the climate crisis has revealed this uh, interesting, more insidious crisis, the uh, crisis of agency, i.e. what to do. Um, and I'm not talking about people in Haiti or other places who are also figuring out what to do, but I'm talking about specifically I'd like to address us, people with every technological and computational and communication and tweeting and educational uh, and locational advantage, um, us, right? Uh, what do we do? Somehow buying a local lettuce, driving at the speed limit, catching the subway, it just doesn't seem sufficient, right? in the face of shared collective uncertain threat. So in order to address this crisis of agency, um, I've sort of set up my work within this framework of the Environmental Health Clinic, uh, which is a way of re reviewing what we take to be health, um, which is a topic, uh, tra transformations in the health system, um, health systems as a kind of national, um, it's on the national dialogue. Oh, is, is there a dialogue with the nation? I don't know. It's on the, the um, uh, it's a national topic. So, but I've been working on this idea of reframing health and our health systems, precisely because the medicalized definitions of health are just tremendously unsatisfying to me. And it has the advantage of actually working and framing my work inside this, in the tradition of institutional critique, this new lab and clinic that I've set up at NYU, has the advantage of kind of recasting re out the problems, figuring out what to do. So what it is, quite simply, is, um, oh, I think I had this. This is, this is our assignment for tonight um, <laughs> from Jema. Um, but what I'm doing is tw uh, a twist on health, right? Redefining health, right? Let me do that again, right? Twisting health, okay. Um, <laughs> The, uh, away from this idea that health is something that's internal and atomized and individualized, pharmaceuticalized and medicalized, into something that's shared and collective, uh, something we can act on. That environmental issues, rather than being out there somewhere or in the uh, polar ice caps with the polar bears or in the Pacific region or in the developing world, I mean, Environmental, health, environmental issues are here in the air quality in this room, right? In the water quality outside. Um, so I'm reframing environmental issues as health issues and health issues as environmental issues and set up this clinic in the context of um, redefining what, what we design and who designs in the context of rethinking who can act, who can change, who can address environmental issues. And of course, the advantage of thinking about environmental issues as environmental health issues as they relate to you, it has a big advantage in the globalized discourse of environmental issues, right? Where we talk about the polar bears, but it's uncertain 
you know, the good work of, of environmentalists for the last 30 years that is to make environmental issues global enough to be newsworthy has this very unfortunate consequence of not making them local enough to be actionable, right? So you can by definition do nothing about global warming. It's depressing, right? Buying a local lettuce is just not gonna do it, right? And so how can we change our institutions to address this? So the Environmental Health Clinic is, is an experiment in doing that. Um, it, uh, it functions like a uh, health clinic using the very familiar institutional script of a health clinic. People who come to the clinic, um, well actually just let me motivate this actually. Uh, people who come to the clinic um, are actually are called uh, impatient because they're too impatient to wait for legislative change to address environmental health issues rather than patients. And, um, and they come with their environmental health concerns rather than medical health concerns. Um, and they walk out with prescriptions not for pharmaceuticals, but for things they can do, things that they've co-produced within the clinical context to uh, measurably improve local environmental health issues. And I just, um, I'd like to kind of motivate it with the work of um, <coughs> our wonderful researcher whose work I've, has greatly influenced me um, uh, at Mount Sinai, Philip Landrigan, who, one of, this is one of the, uh, my kids actually go to the clinic here on, on 11th Street, but this idea that um, what is it that pediatricians do um, with their time, right? What is it that pediatricians spend all their time doing? He did a marvelous survey of, um, figured out that they spend 90% of their hours with patients doing five things. Number one was, can you guess? This is patient time. What are pediatricians spending their time doing? No, this is actually with that. Yes, they're probably doing, <laughs> but of that 10% left, the 90%, <laughs> the time actually with patients, the number one thing that they're treating is asthma and the respiratory re reactive airways issues. Number two, any guesses? That, that's in the top five. Diabetes, did you say? Yeah, I heard this new term, diabesity. I like that. <laughs> yes. But number two is developmental delays, speech delays, uh, or, uh, autism spectrum issues. Number three is like 400 fold increases in rare childhood cancers in the last uh, eight to 10, 15 years. Number four and five are childhood di uh, diabetes and obesity related issues, right? 90% of their time, these are, these are medicos trained in the germ theory, right? Have no capacity. What's common about those top five things? Yeah. Pardon me? Mm, asthma, actually, yeah, it, it's, it's across, uh, across the board. They're all environmental. They're all, they implicate environmental conditions. And our medicos are, of course, radically unprepared to deal with that. Um, for instance, how, well, we'll go into some examples. So the environmental health clinic is set up in that context of maybe health is not this internalized individuated phenomena, but this shared phenomena that we can act on, we can um, localize and we can change. Um, so the Environmental Health Clinic, just to give you a quick introduction to it, um, as potential inpatients, we have field offices, um, we also have um, a clinic at NYU, but the field offices are often more fun, um, where inpatients come. This is a field office um, that we have for talking about um, water quality. Um, this is in the East River, which is uh, actually a marvelous uh, office. Uh, when I'm not using it as a clinic, it's available for finishing off your thesis or um, doing things like that. Let me show you. There's a little bit of live action. Full screen, how do I do that? Full screen, yeah. Um, and that slowed it down. There we go. Um, very good place to be talking about water quality because you can, in fact, of course, smell it. You can see the um, oil slicks, the hydrocarbons on the water. You can point at Newton Creek, which is where, when you flush the toilet, things go. Actually, the point, oh, the difficult thing was this particular version of it was um, uh, a women's environmental health clinic because the men weigh a bit too much, so we had to kick them off. <laughs> you can see here, they, he's like buckling the damn thing. <laughs> anyway. Um, Lose some weight, basically. <laughs> um, so a kind of protocol that you might get at the clinic, um, this is uh, one of the protocols we've developed. There's a whole repertoire of these. But um, this is a, um, uh, an ish edition, one of the first editions. We've got a new edition coming up of um, tadpole bureaucrats. 
These are tadpoles, uh, obviously, each of which is named after a local bureaucrat whose decisions affect water quality, right? Um, so the impatient will raise the tadpole in the, in the water sample in which they're interested. We have some companion animal devices to, to uh, aid this process, their close observation. Um, and um, one of the, and this is for vlogging with your frog, this is, we're doing this because, of course, um, these uh, organisms are exquisitely sensitive biosensors for the whole class of industrial contaminants we call endocrine disruptors, hormone emulators, xenoestrogens um, that are implicated in obesity epidemic, the breast cancer epidemic, the two and a half year drop in the average age of onset of menarche and young girls in this country. Um, these are complex problems. Um, with some uh, raising a tadpole companion. They go through a very, very similar adolescence mediated by the same hormones as our own. Um, and this is, you can take your tadpole out walking in the evening, another companion animal device. Um, and this is, this is the imp important thing that I want to point out when dealing with um, this biological representation of the complex ecosystem, urban ecosystem that we're trying to make sense of, right? The developmental events of a tadpole are very observable. You, you are more observable than our own traumatic adolescence, even though it may have been very traumatic. You know, they grow whole new limbs. They, um, you know, we just grow stumps of them or something. I don't know. We, we, we grow, we, they dissolve organs and grow new ones. I mean, they're, they're, uh, and again, so we can observe the disruptions in their developmental events and really get to know them. And when you take them out walking in the evening with your uh, tadpole walker, your neighbor is going to ask you, this is the tadpole walker, um, your neighbor is going to say, what are you doing, right? And you'll have to introduce it to uh, the tadpole bureaucrat. I, you have to, does anybody here know who their DEP officer or DEC officer is or EPA officer, right? So well, now if you had a tadpole bureaucrat, you would and you'd introduce it to your neighbor. Um, and I swear, or I'll bet you 25 cents, that the next time they see you walking your tadpole, the next time they see you, they will ask you, hey, how is Joe doing? What, you know, what's going on? And you will then, of course, offer to have them friend your tadpole and your social networking site, uh, the <laughs> environmental health clinic site, of course, because it's, um, it's medical records, it's a clinic, it runs like a clinic, but the, cl uh, the clinic records, rather than being the uh, grade A privacy standards of medical clinics, uh, because this is all the environmental commons, because anything you do to improve your environmental health, your air quality, your water quality, in your own interests, the benefits are enjoyed by anyone you share that air quality or water quality with. So it has an aggregating effect, and it's by definition not private. It's by definition not individualized. So your clinic records are all online, as is your tadpole bureaucrat records. So you can friend your tadpole, your friends can friend your tadpole, and we can begin this collective sense-making of these complex ecological um, systems that we are ourselves immersed in. Um, so I just want to give you a couple of examples of the protocols for really making sense of a very complex set of environmental challenges that we're dealing with. This is another protocol I'll, uh, um, that instead of asking you for a urine sample, I'll ask you for a mouse sample when you come to the clinic, which is, uh, begins by designing a better mouse trap. Does anyone here have a domestic arrangement with a mouse? <laughs> yes, you are very lucky. You are extremely lucky. This is uh, because, of course, they're the, they're the gold standard of, um, model organism. 95% of all of our pharmaceuticals are only tested on rats and mice before they're tested on, I mean, administered to humans. Um, so they are actually our stand-in, right? They are, they are our model, our um, representation. Um, and so they make an even better environmental health model organism. Um, because, of course, they share your environmental stressors, the same lead levels, the same asbestos levels, the same, you know, the same environmental stressors, largely the same diet, same mammalian biology, you know, the same the smaller body mass, um, so we can see the effects more readily, shorter lifespan, you know, their livers um, actually metastasize very similarly to ours, and, um, but at smaller doses, so we can really see the effects. So, um, so what happens in this, this is actually, uh, we explore ha uh, cohabitation with our non-human uh, animals, our non-human organisms. This is uh, one of the mouse traps we designed. Uh, what we do is kind of look at the shared responses to environmental stressors, and we went to the medicine cabinet of this particular inpatient who's asked to remain nameless, but um, uh, he, he liked, um, well, he was on a few little antidepressants. This is Prozac, Zoloft, a black jelly bean, and a muscle relaxant. 
So we would uh, see if the mice would actually also, given the same envir environmental stressors, would they self-administer antidepressants? Are they as crazy as we are, right? Um, and vodka in solution, gin in solution, uh, muscle relaxant in solution, and plain water. You can barely see that. Um, you know, would they, uh, would they self-medicate in other ways? Um, and any guesses? Yes, yes, of course, <laughs> they did. <laughs> they have to cope with this. Um, they, liked, uh, they liked Zoloft much better than Prozac. <laughs> Just for your information. Not that anybody here is on an antidepressant, I'm sure. Um, and they liked vodka, of course, as much as they liked plain water, right? Same levels, which of course I understand totally. Um, and then when the mouse is in, in, um, get in, in, actually in the enclosure, it triggers an old cell phone that we put in there and that calls a clinic and we come and pick up the mouse. And we do the blood work and the hair work on the mouse that goes through the standard lab protocol so we can have a look at the body burden that the mouses themselves bear and make a sense again of their lived environmental context. I'm going to skip through a few. This is one of the, um, the prescriptions. So we have these protocols for monitoring. We have prescriptions for acting. Um, this is one of the more popular prescriptions. It's called the no park prescription, which takes a no standing zone like those associated with fire hydrants and prescribes the removal of the asphalt to create an engineered microlandscape. Um, precisely because of this problem that you have all seen, which is interestingly now the most, um, the biggest pollution burden on the New York, New Jersey S3 system is now the massive network of impervious surfaces we call roads and sidewalks. Um, <laughs> and it's that that, of course, uh, is more significant now than the big point source pollution. Uh, you know, the big industrial facilities, the, that all of our environmental activism has been marshaled around, you know, finding the deep pockets and suing their bottoms or something, so, you know, su suing them. Um, and now that, you know, now who do we sue with this kind of problem, right? Who do we, um, is that the strategy? Um, with the um, no park, the creation of an uh, engineered micro landscape, we can, of course, intercept and infiltrate that roadborne pollution, um, grabbing it with all the, the um, surface area of the rocks and pebbles and the subsoil, rehydrating the entire block, the street trees of course like it, and uh, preventing that roadborne pollution from entering the estuary system. It also, and of course, leaf area index is very important. Everyone knows that street trees is a, a good thing. Um, everything, all the environmental services that trees provide are, is in fact related to the leaf area index. They're capturing the particulates, the um, sequestering CO2, the air quality improvements are got to, have got to do with leaves. So we're actually surgically inserting leaf area index in the, the boundary layer that's called the stroller height effect, um, the stroller height problem, which is the uh, problem of a, I think it's a, terrible problem um, with a cute name, but um, a kid in a stroller has a thousand times worse air quality than the adult standing behind them, right? Because that's where the tailpipes are, the unburned. Um, so <clears throat> this intercepts right here and um, we go on. I just want to sort of point out it continues to function as an uh, as a uh, emergency vehicle parking space, but of course we um, you know, a fire truck can come along and flatten a few plants, park on it. In fact, there's, it's less likely to be obstructed, I would, I would guess. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, big deal if they flatten it, it'll regenerate its plants, right? Um, but 99% of the time when it's not uh, a parking space for emergency vehicles, it's uh, servicing the environmental health emergency. It's redefining what is the, what is the emergency. So I wanted to show you a few of those. That's a sort of a prescription. And there's one that I was coming up um, that we're just about to la launch a clinical trial um, that I want to skip through called the solar chimney that um, some of you might be interested in. Sort of in lieu of the failure of the Copenhagen um, discussions um, of global uh, bodies trying to negotiate um, for action in the face of this shared collective uncertain threat. There's a, um, a small component of um, some other systems we've been developing called actually the Drawing in Air project, which um, looks um, like a solar chimney. As you know, a solar chimney heats up, hot air rises. Um, that's greenhouse effect, right? Greenhouse effect against the greenhouse effect. 
um, when we put um, a few of these up and we've got a new edition of these coming out, um, we take a standard HVAC um, particulate um, filter and we put it on top of a plastic bag of some sort. Um, and then, of course, the hot air rises and we pull through that amorphous carbon. Um, when we put that up, this is my child labor. Um, uh, but uh, here is a, another edition of it. Um, <clears throat> when the, the, um, that $7 HVAC filter is grimy, they send it back to me. I release the amorphous carbon and bind it with a wax into a pencil, the length of which measures the amount of grime that we've pulled out of the air, right? And amorphous carbon black, carbon black as it's called, combined with ozone, is responsible for about half of the global warming effects we're seeing now. It's the stuff that changes the reflectance of snow and ice. It changes the reflectance of the, of that, um, uh, of the ap atmosphere. It's, uh, you know, it's that grime that you can wipe off every windowsill. It's uh, um, part of and parcel of inefficient combustion, but it's a low-hanging fruit. We can do something about it. And this is a clinical trial that we're launching now to really measure what it is that we can take in, what we can do with a $15 uh, drawing in air solar chimney um, to, to pull out some of this. Okay, so that was um, just a couple of the examples. I just want to show you three more interfaces that now start to reimagine. Um, and one of the other design challenges that I think is our major, um, uh, I'm a major challenge to our, the legacy institutions and our cultural imagination. The fact that we cohabit with non-human organisms, that we can talk about biodiversity and, you know, this is part of global biodiversity loss that we all bemoan, but, you know, what does biodiversity look like here? You know, what could, why can we talk about biodiversity in Costa Rica when we haven't figured out how to do biodiversity in Manhattan, right? How, where, can, where can we go with that? So the Ooze Project is a set of interfaces, zoo backwards, of course, Ooze and zoo backwards and without cages, to kind of facilitate and recognize, goodness, it's really, it's really bleaching out. Is that, can we can, it is too light. Is it really? Okay, I pushed it too far, I did. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. Well, let me tell you, that's um, a map of the Bronx ooze, which we launched recently, which is, uh, is renamed, um, you can go to whos.org, which is wildlifehabitatooze.org, um, and you'll see there the map that you can't see here of um, the island formerly known as Manhattan, um, which is now, we called it Decentral Park, uh, to nom as a nomica that it's, um, of course, uh, you know, Nature isn't inside little boxes we call parks. It's, uh, it's everywhere, um, and uh, our biodiversity matters in all sorts of places outside of those little boxes. We've renamed um, the Bronx, the borough of the Bronx, the Bronx Ooze, except for the, where the Bronx Zoo is in the New York Botanic Gardens, um, again, to, uh, to show you. Okay, I'm really just going to let me change this because it's not going to work if I... I'm sorry, how much of this have you not seen? You just... <laughs> Most of it? Okay, here we go. Why don't we try? This one? This will be ugly, I'm sorry, but it'll be at least brighter. It'll be stretched and ugly. Okay, this is a, um, a recent um, interface for non humans we launched um, September last year called the, well, I call it the fish restaurant, a place where you feed fish rather than eat them. Um, and what it is is a series of boo buoys that uh, when a fish swims underneath, uh, light turns on, right? So the fish leave a trail of lights as they're going underneath. We deployed this in the East River in the Bronx River. Here it is in the Bronx River. And what it is and implemented, the top light is actually a dissolved oxygen sensor or a water quality sensor. It moves from, shifts from, it's an always on light that shifts from a warm red color to a cool blue color when the um, dissolved oxygen is, is high, um, red when it's warm. Um, is that now I'm making you seasick? Is that <laughs> okay? I'm working. <laughs> Keep putting you. In. Um, and when a fish goes here, you can see here uh, when a fish goes underneath. Um, are there fish in the East River? Yes, <laughs> there they are. <laughs> there they are. Um, of course, this uh, once there's fish there, people start to to uh, they have strange um, behaviour at. Every New York City park, of course, 
that says, do not feed the animals. At every zoo, there's a big sign, do not feed the animals. When people see animals, they start throwing Doritos and chewing gum <laughs> and cigarette butts, right? It's like um, kind of that, that desire to interact is as ubiquitous as those signs, do not feed the animals, right? So not only can you, um, can you see that there's uh, animals there, you can also actually um, text the, the, uh, the fish there. So we have here um, at the site, we actually have the business cards and, and contact details for all the organisms you might actually uh, want to uh, stay in touch with, um, schmooze with, social network with. Here's the org chart of um, some of our the Bronx River um, uh, org chart and the uh, etc. Um, so you can sort of t text your, we've turned our phones off, but um, the, the, the site of the Bronx River is actually where the first beaver in 200 years has moved into, uh, built a lodge in New York City. Um, you can text him, Yo Beaver, it's his contact uh, details, and, um, and you can track him. He's a bit like, um, he's like every other, actually. He's a lot like two million other single, desperate males in New York City, he, um, he's always texting you, asking you for, um, you know, up for a cross-species adventure, come over to my lodge, you want to see, you know. Um, so they have, they have characters and they have, they initiate interaction. There's also, um, uh, as I said, it's a fish restaurant. Instead of Doritos, perhaps we can do a bit better, right? Perhaps we can feed them. Um, something that's nutritionally appropriate. So these are the lures that we've developed, which are nutritionally appropriate. They're based on uh, gelin, which is an agar uh, extract. Um, so that um, you can imagine a school bus full of kids offering lures to the, um, to the fish. And of course, that might augment the nutritional resources that we've ourselves depleted. The other thing is, well, the hook is, there is no hook. Um, and the... Um, that these uh, lures are augmented with a shielding agent, uh, which is a chitinol, a chitinase, chitinol ex, a chitin extract um, that binds to the bioaccumulated heavy metals and PCBs and complexes them, helps them pass it out as a, in a complex form where it's less reactive, settles into the silters and effectively, it's effect effectively removed from bioavailability. So, Again, what you're seeing is a systems level effect, or I'm gesturing at a systems level effect, that the collective action of these individual interactions could amount to significant environmental remediation, right? In contrast to the uh, Army Corps of Engineers dredging the Hudson that has just, first stage is just completed, right? In this case, we're taking advantage of the bioamplification, the, the um, community structure of the uh, non-humans, our neighbors in the East River and the Hudson River. Of course, um, they amplify up through, they bioaccumulate the heavy metals. 90% of the mercury in, in our own bodies is from, from the fish there. And that, um, that allows us to kind of take advantage, like a targeted drug delivery system, where it's the, the uh, pollutants are the most highly concentrated, as opposed to the brutal 1950s approach of dredging the, the entire, resuspending all the, all the uh, you know, pollutants that have settled and been covered by about seven centimeters of, of silt, and you know, shipping that sludge, that toxic sludge, to Pennsylvania, Texas, and the nearest third world country that will take it right, where it continues to be toxic sludge. Right? So there's a very radically different approach of a, a participatory, tunable, responsive, adaptive uh, remediation process as opposed to the brutal, let's dredge the fuckers or something. Well, I don't know what sort of, um, excuse me, I'm sorry. I'm breaking into my Australian. Um. <laughs> so in this, oh, they also fluoresce in UV, the um, lures, all sorts of things, because of course that's how, how birds and fish coordinate this massively interesting, complex movement of schools of them in the murky water where you can't actually see like two centimeters in front of you, right? They can, they can see actually 40 feet because they use UV and coordinate through UV, so you have fluorescent um, lures. And this is actually a, a plate from the Cross Species Supper Club that we've recently initiated and the Cross Species Cookbook that I've been working on for a, quite a while, which is actually a, a um, 
uh, meals that are food that is delicious and nutritious to humans and non-humans, because we, we eat the same stuff, actually. So um, we live inside the same system. We, uh, we have, um, I'll introduce you to some edible cocktails in a minute. Um, I am going to finish off just two more little interfaces to, to make the point. Um, the goose dinner from the Cross Species Cookbook, for instance, you don't eat the goose, you eat the food that geese, that geese eat. So for example, um, vegetable matter underfoot shows the process used in making this dish. In the kitchen, the chef imitates the methods that geese use pond side to mash down the vegetation, thus producing a vegetable carpaccio, um, et cetera. Um, and the Cross Species Supper Club, or actually as we call it, the Cross Species Adventure Club that we've just launched, um, is uh, a monthly, occasional, um, seven course, five to seven course adventure in tasting the complexity of biodiversity. Um, this is the invitation um, which we ask you to, uh, on one side we have a little QR code that's uh, camouflaged, um, and it's actually printed on uh, edible, uh, so it's an edible uh, invitation. Um, again, to kind of explore how we might not have to use these more permanent materials for these very ephemeral uh, phenomena. Once you've absorbed the information, read it, that is, and, and snapped it in your phone, um, we, you can eat it. It's quite delicious. Um, uh, and there, here are some of the, um, here are the lures uh, to give you um, an introduction to it. Um, I wanted, this is the last project I'm coming into now, but just to give you a taste of this, um, this is Murkish Delight, um, a taste of the wetlands, um, because of course you might all know that wetlands are the new technology of the 21st century, the high tech um, of the 21st century is wet and slimy, and uh, here is how we can um, kind of culturally reimagine the bogs, the swamps, the marshes that we have so devalued and denigrated. Only 8% of the entire US land mass is, or was originally wetlands that did all the, you know, protected the entire terrestrial ecosystem and the aquatic ecosystem, both marine and freshwater systems. And we've degraded more than half of it. In California, more than 95% of the wetlands are gone, right? Gone. Of course they're having water problems, right? That's, uh, um, that's so how might we reimagine the value of wetlands. And the interesting thing is here, look at, this is Steve Dietz, look at his face. He's very much enjoying this. <laughs> you can tell that. But our non-human um, collaborators um, might actually have some interesting help for us. This is an um, uh, introduction to Levitum, which is a, a wonderful um, uh, soil bacteria, ubiquitous soil bacteri bacteria that's associated with wetlands. Um, and here's an interesting quote for you. Addressing the amphibian extinction crisis represents the greatest species conservation challenge in the history of humanity, only because, of course, the frogs and amphibians actually uh, live through the dinosaur species extinction crisis, but they're, they're disappearing now. Um, this is the largest ex species extinction crisis in the last five to eight years that the Earth has seen since the dinosaurs. So we've got something to think about with this. And Levitum may come to the rescue in so much as um, this is another one, wet kisses. Levitum actually produces a, um, a very interesting substance called violosian, being investigated for all sorts of medical reasons as an anti-leukemic agent, anti-tumorigenic. Um, but most importantly, there's a few um, frogs and salamanders that have been surviving the chytrid fungus, which is one of the major um, causative agents in the demise of frogs and amphibians across the world. The, uh, the uh, chytrid fungus is, uh, was brought to you by your friendly neighborhood pregnancy test, actually. The, between the 1920s and 1960s, 70s, um, they used these African claw frogs where they take the urine of potentially pregnant women. Remember I was saying that frogs have the same hormones we do, right? They take the urine of potentially pregnant women, they inject it under the skin of a male or female, um, African clawed frog, and then if it produced a sperm sac or an egg sac, we knew women were pregnant, right? That was a standard thing. But then in the 70s, something, you know, some new process came in, and, um, you know, the, Peter was getting active, and so they, they let go of the frogs. And it's actually, and the chytrid fungus is endemic to the African clawed frog that's being widely released across the world. It's killing all the frogs in, in Australia, throughout the US, throughout the world. 
thanks to our medical labs um, and our scientific procedures. But to the rescue is libidum, viva libid libidum, that produces bilocean. So the only frogs and salamanders that are surviving the chytrid fungus, turns out they have this, this libidum fungus in the microbial community on their backs. Um, so <clears throat> this is wet kisses, which is a marshmallow for kissing a frog formerly known as Prince. Um, a very yummy edible cocktail, which actually is purple because it has um, the uh, bilocin in it. And when you eat this cocktail, not too many, they're actually quite strong, a lot of cognac, but when you eat the cognac, you're ready to, your lips are inoculated with the bilocin and the libidum, so you're prepared to kiss a frog and see what happens. Okay. Um, I'll jump through a few other things. Some, you might like to try some salamander tails. There's actually an X prize for the production of victimless f flesh. You know, salamanders are the only terrestrial organisms that can just drop half their body mass, right? Their tail, at the sort of inconvenient predatory kind of grab. I'll just drop it, right? So they've actually solved this X prize already. Um, so FYI, thanks to the salamander. Um, and if you're prepared to try. And the whole Northeast actually rests on the flesh of salamanders. You know, the biomass of frogs and salamanders in this area, unlike other areas, is um, if you took all the vertebrates, all the deer, raccoons, squirrels, coyotes, and rolled them into a big ball, and then took all the salamanders and frogs and amphibians and rolled them into a big ball, that ball is four times the size of all the vertebrate mammals. Right? They're everywhere, right? or they were. Um, and a lot of a lot of us re uh, rest on it. I'm going to skip the rhinoceros beetle wrestling. Um, <laughs> we'll come back to that some other time. Um, but um, I wanted to introduce you the th sort of a new project that is in development that I'm working on um, currently with the brave assistance of Miriam, who's here, and um, a couple of other graduate students in the um, environmental health clinic. Um, and it's really about addressing the uh, wetland issue, but it's based on the, um, this very specific strategy that I think we've all identified but not quite said, that new technologies present the opportunity for change, for kind of radically reimagining what we do and how we do it and who we do it with. And um, there's a sexy new technology that you might have um, come across recently called, well, um, the sexiest one is the Icon aircraft, which is here, designed, lead designer is Steen Strand. Um, and uh, it's, it's part of actually one of 30 new planes that are coming into this light sport aircraft um, class. The light sport aircraft class is uh, actually was, is newly created by the FAA. So now it's about $3,000 in a weekend to get a pilot's license, a sport pilot license. It's about 100K to get one of these, these planes. So they're trying to usher in the era of personal flight. And um, of course, that's, that asks us, that begs the question, how might we more radically reimagine urban mobility through flight? And I think that the problem of this is that, of course, flight, um, many of us would think that flight is the worst thing we can do, right? And of course, flying to Australia every year to see a parent, the, the guilt that I that had the... Um, uh, being known as an environmentalist and being attacked for flying, right? And see my parents, have, come on, give me a break, right? I'm not going to feel, well, I do feel bad about that, but, <laughs> but I can't tell my parents. No, I, it's just, I, um, I think we can redesign those systems, right? So all those wetlands that we've degraded, right? Mostly in the name of flight. Those cheap swamps that were flat land, proximal to unbuilt on in, uh, JFK, LaGuardia, LAX, SFO, right? These are all major wetlands that we've degraded in the name of flight. So could we use this opportunity to, of flight to reimagine how we use this? This is actually a, um, the uh, nitrogenous, the denutrification of the terrestrial ecosystem and the nutrification of the aquatic ecosystem from a uh, recent satellite picture. Um, of course, all the stuff is running off. Um, I want to show you, what do I want to show you? I want to show you the, um, the strap-on flight simulator. Uh, and I can show that to you here. I think here, in action. Here is um, the first prototype, the first edition of the strap-on flight simulator. Um, 
for, uh, okay, anyone done hand flying? When you actually increase the surface area by, by about five times, it's just great. <laughs> just, oh, you know, it really it takes it away. It's really fun. Um, but of course, the, the visceral experience of, does anybody here imagine themselves as a pilot? A couple, a couple. I mean, it's a problem. If we're going to seize this opportunity of, of personalized flight to kind of more radically rethink our own urban mobility, to change the fact of whether or not we should and can and must um, uh, rethink uh, our urban mobility, um, we've got to have more people thinking about it, not just kind of the crazed first person fighter pilot you know, Xbox flyers. In fact, I would argue, and there's many, much evidence to suggest that putting your hand out and using your car as a wind tunnel gives you the kind of experience of the angle attack and the maneuverability that actually transfers better into an actual flight experience than a uh, visual experience. And uh, there's also a strap-on flight, uh, strap-on black box, so you can stick your iPhone out the window too. Um, <laughs> And that will log three axis acceleration changes and uh, your GPS and your, your um, so you can upload your flight log as well. Um, you can do a uh, autopilot exam uh, here, which will, you can, uh, once you've passed, you can then join the imaginary Air Force, which you can see here. Um, very important to, to have that kind of, you know, um, to demilitarize and decommercialize flight, to reclaim it. Remember uh, Amelia Earhart, right? When flight, flight was the original internet, right? People, were, it was going to be the end of all wars when Amelia was around, right? And Kingsford Smith, right? They were, uh, you could just fly over and talk to the people. You didn't have to have wars, but it somehow got um, got seized, embroiled uh, into uh, into the military imagination. Um, so, of course, the thing about the Icon aircraft that the uh, reason why I'm working with it is it's an amphibious plane. So, we can in fact offer a private landing strip, a wet landing strip, um, that costs about $5,000 to build a wet landing as opposed to about 100k to build a terrestrial landing because uh, you have to grade them and, you know, there's a lot more engineering involved. So, a constructed wetland. Um, about 500 to 750 feet. Also, in addition to sort of as a, um, if you will, an iPhone add-on or uh, accessory, right, your own wet landing private airstrip, is also a bi biodiversity hotspot and can be inoculated with that Levitum bacteria, the new hero we've uh, recently discovered. And, um, of course, the planes can go from one to the other, re-inoculating, resupplying the... Um, the levitum um, and protecting those unkissed uh, frogs and salamanders. Um, so the question that I uh, would like to remain, uh, sort of leave in as we kind of struggle to redesign or seize the opportunities that new technologies present to us, in this case the Icon aircraft, which is um, actually uh, launching officially in a couple of weeks at JFK. Um, to seize these opportunities, our technological opportunities, to address and reimagine our institutional frameworks requires the participation and the intelligent sense making of every one of us. It requires, as the previous speaker said, it requires all of us to figure out, to tune, to does that work? Does it work for me? Does it work here? Does it work well? Can I do a no park? Can I do, you know, what is it? Can I, what kind of lifestyle experiment can I do? And it's only through this, what might be called thinking, which is T-H-I-N-G, K-I-N-G, or critical, um, critical making as opposed to just critical thinking. Um, it's only by the hands-on coordination of things, stuff, non-human collaborators, and the complexity of our urban ecosystems that we can begin to make sense of what to do. Thank you.
that's here. Good. Complexity overwhelming. Okay. Well, that um, my enviable or unenviable job is now to try and make connections. Um, and um, I think the nice thing is that actually we have we'll try and leave some time for questions because I'm sure you all have a lot of questions. But um, I'm really intrigued by this. I, both of you mentioned kind of sense making um, as perhaps a new capacity, a new kind of um, uh, sort of acumen that we might need uh, to survive this c kind of complex mess that we've created. Can you talk a little more? Or what do you think of each other's sense making? Are they the same sense making? Yeah, he said everything I was trying to say better. But <laughs> I was going to say the exact same thing. Um, I think they are, but they come from, very, from not very different directions, but different attitudes, which are both really important. I mean, that's when I actually say I spent the first three years of my working life as a soil and wetlands microbiologist. Um, <laughs> you did? Yeah. So, yeah, the bacterial and needs... And he did complex uh, adaptive systems. Yeah, that's how we got into it. He's the perfect man. Um, <laughs> Are you already... <laughs> you to my wife. <laughs> um, <laughs> Is she here tonight? Is she here? I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, she may differ. <laughs> I, I think the sense-making aspect is is critical because the tools that we have for existing in a, a small environment, the structured environment of our house, our workplace, our whatever, are not, uh, or when we're growing up in a family, for instance, they're social, they're used to dealing with a range of interactions that don't scale to the kinds of scope and interactions that we need to survive in, you know, the bigger complex world. Mm. Um, if you can phrase it that way, or when things are changing so quickly, where the challenges are beyond, apparently, my individual action. And use the word apparently. And that the social systems and structures that were put in place to sort of mediate that for us, to simplify it so that we could act with demo social democratic institutions or the institutions that were designed to do that, aren't coping either. And so the sense, the necessity for me to get new prosthetics, if you like, mm. to help me understand that, new tools, and it is a design process. So I see that as being a real strong common link. Mm. And I think social networking, or what I was talking about as being societal networking, uh, just starting to say, how can electronic tools help us understand that, reformulate it, and make use of it in a different way? Do you see it as a similar sense making? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there is very different focus. Pokai, plural, right? Because um, the, the idea that um, it's very easy to think that anything we do ourselves as individuals um, is kind of has no significance, right? Can is not in any way measurable. But figuring out that's not a given, right? That is something that we can figure out. So, for instance, the no parks, right? If we there's two or three fire hydrants in every city block in, in Manhattan. They cost about, you know, two to three, four thousand dollars to do with a concrete cutter and vegetation and, and some subsoil storage. Um, but if we changed every fire hydrant to a, a no park, a vegetated um, context, we would, we would infiltrate every drop of roadborne pollution, every bit of stormwater, and Prevent it. This is our this is our major our major pollution board burden in this context. So those small actions can aggregate, but they can't aggregate. They have to be designed. It is only an impatient on that block who can drive and do and co-design and figure out a particular uh, no park that's relevant to the soil situation and their neighbors and enlist their neighbors and say, well, I'll take care of it. And I'm, you know, it's, it's only the highly local um, context that can produce something that's really optimized and measurable, right? If we had a, um, a mayoral initiative to do no parks, we'd get much less effective no, mo no, par mo no parks, right? So this idea of how we can aggregate small individual and small group actions into significant environmental effect has the benefit of uh, drawing on the kind of terrestrial, the SETI, the, the uh, terrestrial intelligence of all of us, right? Of many of us being able to make sense of it. So the DOT engineers who I've become quite friendly with over the last couple of years. I hope they react uh, <laughs> 
Well, they are still reacting, and um, it's a. Uh, then they're not the engines of innovation. Individually, they might be nice guys or guys, um, most of them, uh, ones I'm dealing with. They, uh, but but they're not. They're constrained institutionally. Um, they're not innovating. They're not figuring out. I'm going to do this no park as a butterfly truck stop and attract, you know, plant all the habitat provisioning for 40 species of butterflies that occur here, right? They're, they're not the people who can do that because of their institutional constraints, but if we can figure out how to work with them, the people on 6 and B can figure that out, you know, so, and so it's those, co that coordination. I think that's, that's where we, we do think and we do intuit on an institutional level um, how we can reimagine our legal, legacy institutions. They do aggregate our individual actions into, you know, without reducing their complexity or their uh, their optimization into something more significant. So, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, I, I see a similar thing sometimes when I'm, I said I had these meetings with Canadian police chiefs and so forth, the same with US domestic police chiefs or public safety officials. They have this institutional con context that's been built up that hasn't adapted very well to the changing circumstances they find them in with their communities. And I'll say because they've adapted very strongly and extremely robustly to sort of external threats like terrorism or something like this. So everybody's gone absolutely focused for new institution strengthening, if you like. Um, none of them want to be involved in anything that's institution weakening. Um, and so there's an interesting conversation that happens around when I talk to them about how are these social networking tools, for instance, or other new ways of community formation at bottom up? People, people are talking to each other, get over it, right? How do you tap into that? And they see it as intelligence sources or as um, intelligence operations they can conduct, it's very military terminology. Um, but for most of them, you can drag them back a little bit back to things like neighborhood watch, um, mm. these community based things. And they're often thinking about, well, I, I've tried to run neighborhood watch programs. We've tried to institutionalize it again from the top down. And so the conversations I'm trying to have with them say, well, how can you imagine a neighborhood watch like thing um, or community policing to occur uh, with people wanting to organize it for their block rather than right. vigilante squads right. or something mm -hmm. like that? Uh, I mean, I think neighborhood watch, it's, it's something I've been dealing with this because we're opening an environmental health clinic in Toronto um, at the moment, and they have this very successful mm. model of neighborhood watch. And it is a model of civic participation, but it's an it's a insidious kind of, it's about spying on each other, right? So yeah. it's a model of participation, but it's, I think it's, it's important to differentiate that the, the non-renewable or the renewable resource that we have is the creative imagination and the generative capacity of kind of, not not the kind of community policing, yeah. but the collective design um, that people do so or can do, and so I think one of the constraints that we have certainly in teaching the designers of the next generation is, um, you know, what design is, what design is for, because of the idea models and those the institutions of design, which is you know, for shorthand, it's prostitution, right? It's doing it for the money, right? It's doing it, it's selling your creative and generative skills for, you know, whoever IDEO's medical device client is or whatever, right? So is there a way to institutionalize a kind of design practice that's accountable uh, to, you know, a diverse set of inpatients? So the way that the environmental health clinic model is kind of promulgating now, the first one opening in Toronto, one in Reykjavik, and one in Kuwait coming up, and maybe one in Australia, although, <laughs> um, is, you know, interesting designers who set up a referral network, um, residencies, to work on real cases of design and figuring out how to fund that, how to support it. In each case, each project is different, but it's it's an institutional rethink of who gets to design, right, and who, what 
context in which, who they're accountable to. But what you're effectively designing is the community, right, and the way the communities interact with each other. Would you say that? No. Does that sound like social engineering? <laughs> well, in the, in the sense that we've been talking You've about been design not as a top-down process, but as right. helping something emerge, perhaps. Yeah, I, I suppose if I were to characterise it, it's kind of an evidence-driven, um, you create kind of collective sense-making opportunities, mediagenic opportunities, ideas where everybody's life is not about lifestyle choices and the performance of those lifestyle choices, but lifestyle experiments where the visible, what is she doing with her hand at the window, you know, that thing on, right? What is that about, right? And having to account for, well, I might get a plane. What's it to you, right? You know, you know there are only 100, maybe we could share one, right? This, this whole idea of uh, figuring out how would I like to get around given my druthers? Is there something more than the, this kind of consumer, responsible consumer response to environmental issues where we can somehow buy our way out of this? Or is there more kind of more energy to reimagine and redesign than the few professional designers who can be very good and very seductive and very uh, expensive, um, but sort of working in this kind of hybrid, co-producing it with particular communities of experts, maybe just one other person maybe a block association, maybe a local community board, maybe, but working in these hybrid, so it's not one community design, but it's sort of figuring out how do you institutionalize a kind of evidence-driven feedback um, form of experimenting with complex adaptive systems. I'm trying to see if there's any of the students from our class in here, and I'm probably fortunate there aren't. Um, <laughs> hands up, no, good. Um, so we're running this collab. I'm assisting Madhan Ratnam, who's on faculty here, running this collab uh, for graduate students for the most part on design for the Red Cross. Um, the fun bit about it is that so Red Cross locally and the local chapter here and the response, I don't know, they go out to every single fire in the city and offer services, food, shelter and housing, some money, all kinds of different things. Um, it's one of the things they do and then the national level sort of various response and coordination and advocacy things. And, International level working with the Climate Centre for the Red Cross, which is about um, find, helping people find ways to identify and adapt to climate change, increasing disasters, all kinds of effects that has. But the great thing about working with the class and the students is that sort of watching the Red Cross local chapter here get really excited because effectively what they saw it as is, I mean, sure, it's a free lab for them. There's a bunch of free services, potentially solutions that might help them in lots of ways, and we're sort of telling them that it won't come out in any particular way that, you know, no guarantees here, basically. They could be exploratory pieces or they could be very practical pieces. We just did the reviews last Friday for the midterms. Um, but they didn't care in some sense because uh, the head of the Red Cross for the region said, it's great, I've got new recruits. I've got them for life now. He sort of basically figured that he took them in for life and that he effectively would have these volunteer services of people who would then be engaged as volunteers, because we made them do ride-alongs and become right. volunteers, but effectively bring that skill set to that participation right. now and hopefully beyond. So I think it's really interesting to think about, I think it ties very well to what you were saying in a slightly different way, but I'm really glad about the fact that these students are totally engaged with the local community or the global community, however their problems they're trying to solve. But it's clearly not just about the educational experience. It's actually something about contributing right. and about participating and collaborating, I hope. I mean, right. Maybe we'll get there. This is the first one we've done. So I think it's really interesting to imagine that as a different mode of, of them being designers or growing into being designers. Right. I, I want to ask one, what I might describe as the kind of $64 million question um, prompted by both of your presentations. And that's... Um, that it seems as though both of you are talking about uh, the potential for phenomenon that are sort of seeded in high, kind of hyper-localized situations, um, kind of uh, taking root, but also, you know, kind of pollinating into other um, seedlings and spreading that widely. And we see a great example of that and, and um, lots of famous examples of that, whether it's with YouTube or with Twitter in your example earlier today, of technologies that kind of appear Nobody has much use for them. 
and then within a few months they within a few months they scale up to 130 million users and all of these kind of ancillary new services and opportunities that are pres present as a result of that and so they manage to go from something that's uh, fairly small to fairly distributed and uh, large quite quickly and it seems to me that both of you are talking about um, the inherent difficulties from a design standpoint of designing things that can scale that quickly from the hyper-local um, or from the sort of hyper-localized um, to the systemic level, let's say, um, with any of that same speed. It's, it's super difficult. So how come in technology, how come, you know, idiots dancing in front of their computer can get, you know, 500 million hits, but these small, interesting design projects always end up being seen by a couple hundred people and, you know, and maybe a few more if we're lucky, but what, does it take, what will it take to design those things so that they can speed and scale up at the same rate as these other technologies? I don't know. Yeah, it is the $64 million question. It's one that I actually get a lot, right? Because what I do is kind of experiments and, um, and, uh, and people are looking to, you know, various of the, you know, how do you, how do you get hundreds and, you know, how do you, no products, how do you promulgate them with any of the little devices or, um, and um, to my, um, I think with designing stuff, we're working on multiple levels. So the idea, of course, of the um, strap-on flight simulator is something that I'm actually figuring out how to now um, have a nice thing with TechShop and a few of the other laser printers where you can download and tweak your aerofoil and then uh, get a laser cut with a hexagonal um, aerofoil. Um, structure. So you assemble it, right? Just like IKEA, you can build it yourself. There's just 150 pieces as opposed to five. But, um, but you can also tweak it and you can kind of crowdsource the optimization of mm. the... Um, and I'm much more interested in the idea that we can take something like the sexiest and hardest problem in space systems engineering and aeronautical engineering when, you know, when I was there was aerofoil design, right? That's, that's hard. That's not something that a motley crew of, you know, designers and artists and kind of activists and, you know, act, you know, environmental activists could ever possibly contribute anything to, right? That's, you know, it's just big science is, has gone and got, got a definition on that. And, and that's what I think can actually really scale. It's this idea that you don't have to be a professional scientist to actually do an experiment. In fact, John Dewey's idea was that it was very important that participatory democracy be, be based on experimentation, right? On the skeptical experimentation of many people, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's what can scale. That idea that, hey, you're licensed to experiment with aerofoil design. And even you could reimagine, you know, whether or not you have to have a, why don't you just live on a lake, right? And you don't have to. <laughs> You don't have to go live by the freeway, right? You know, the, the, the sort of the reimagining can scale much more mm. easily than the technology. And so being able to promulgate um, both within the art and design world uh, kind of a, a culture of experimentation, um, being able to promulgate the idea of being able to move that experimentation away from, this is, I think, where we differ. Um, crisis is a great way of coordinating a lot of resources, but particularly with complex urban systems that are, you know, maybe we don't want to wait till Hurricane Katrina mm. um, to change and reimagine our aquatic infrastructure, right? Maybe we want to figure out how to kind of playfully experiment with um, difference and and I think that's actually um, that's harder to make people feel qualified to do right I know I you know have a PhD and and I feel intimidated by endocrine disruptors and xenoestrogens and the the interaction effects of the 20th 
20,000 or more synthetic xenoestrogens that are widely distributed in our bodies. It's hard stuff to make sense of, right? But um, feeling qualified to kind of ask those questions and to do an experiment and to have evidence. So the combination actually of the, of the tadpole walking is that you take your namesake, your, your um, tadpole when it graduates to a frog and introduce it to its namesake, right? And then discuss the evidence that you've collected along the way by observing it, right? So, because you have something to discuss, you have evidence, you have, and if you've raised a tadpole for a year, you've had ideas about, you know, what's going on and what's doing that. So that's, that's I think, something that can scale perhaps more than any particular technology. It's a question-driven uh, reimagining, reimagining our relationship to natural systems which perhaps is in the end more important than being able to tweet. Mm. Or yeah. Well, I, I'd say I don't think we disagree about the, the problems with crisis because having helped run responses to some enormous nasty things, uh, it's, you know, that's just the worst way to try and deal with anything, unfortunately. I've just had to try and work in that. But it's all about the preparedness. It's about the resiliency and building that in and how do you do that. Um, it's part of the reason the project I'm working on now is very much around how do you get systems in use ahead of time that are suitable for lots of different uses, including helping people respond uh, better. Um, I, I'm going to utter some evil, evil words as a quote, which is sort of democratizing the means of production in a way. Um, that I think one of the things about YouTube and someone dancing stupidly in front of a, a webcam is that uh, there's a whole pile of new methods, whether it's that or 3D printing or lots of other things that are, are changing how we can access and design individually and share those designs and communities that enable the sharing of designs and concepts that I think is really exciting. I mean, you get a huge amount of what I call trash. I feel it's trash. Mm -hmm. Other mm -hmm. people value it differently, right? Coming out of it, you'll get that with 3D printers, you'll get that with everything else coming out. But that leaves the open question about how can you use these tools and communities to make a difference, to change. Right? And that's the bit I don't think we understand very well. Hmm. It's about how do you uh, use behavioral economics, how do you use just experimentation, trying and learning and doing different things like you're doing, right? um, to raise questions, look at how people answer them, interact with them as they do so, and then try and build communities around doing things differently um, that are self-reinforcing and supporting. And we don't understand well enough how that can work. Right. And I don't think we'll ever get it by designing down. We'll only mm. get it by trying up. Um, and yeah. Uh, I'd like to open this up to questions. Um, all I ask is that because we're um, putting this online, that you come up to the microphone and pose your question there so that we can uh, have it for all our listeners um, in TV land. On YouTube. Who'd rather be watching the dancing, right? right. <laughs> they have that in the other window. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> it's going on. Okay. Yeah, come on up. Sorry, I gotta bring my notes because it's kind of suffering a couple parts. Um, it sounds like what I mean, at least I definitely got the first uh, part of your of your presentation. You're talking about agency crisis. Is that correct? Um, and I think what, what we're both talking about, everybody's talking about here, is kind of a system of education. Um, I know that, you know, on a micro level, certainly educating, um, you know, just from kids to PhD students. Uh, sorry, I'm going to take a breath. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not very good at public speaking. Um, <clears throat> It sounds like we're talking about education, and I just want to know, if we're stepping back, it's how, we, uh, how can we scale this? And I'm wondering, I'm, like, I'm reading this book that I found the other day called Philanthropic Capitalism, and it's talking about using um, how people like Gates, uh, Bono, Buffett have all kind of leveraged their networks, NGOs, um, just a whole different array of organizations to, for example, deliver products, whether it be health care um, or education as a product. I'm wondering how you think that's applicable to what you've been discussing. And um, especially from a systems kind of vantage point, if you think that's viable, should it be, is that too much of a top-down approach? Or do you think there's room for that? Is, is it too oligarchic almost? 
or, sorry. Great, good question. I can jump on that. Sure. <laughs> Got a couple of things. So. Um, because there's a lot of effort, particularly with environmental education and why, for instance, there isn't any engineering in any of our education system, right? What you can't do, you can't build anything, right? And the systematic idea that making stuff doesn't matter, right? It's not, you can't get into a good university by, you know, it doesn't get you good SAT scores, it just doesn't get you anywhere. And, um, and you know, there's certainly a, a, great, a great many people who are focused on, on the education system and manipulating the education system and somehow getting, uh, certainly a, there's a, a nice thing because I like its name, it's called No Child Left Inside Coalition, um, which is trying to get environmental education, the capacity for kids to actually get out of the classroom and hang out in, um, in wild places, right, where they're unscripted, where they're not being told what to observe, where they're not being, where they can ask all sorts of questions. And that is a legitimate and powerful form of, of education, right? So there's a great many people who are working on teaching teachers, and certainly professionally, I'm in the teacher there, Steinhardt, that's what I do, right, nominally. But I never say I do that, because, um, because teachers are so constrained in such a complex system and their capacity to, you know, this good sense of it is, you know, people spend, uh, how much time do you spend in school in your life? Wouldn't that be a good time to get environmental education in there? But it turns out it would be better to try and get to people in their sleep, right? Because it's less constrained in their sleep, right? Like as a teacher, you've got, you know, more capacity. You know, and you spend about the same amount of time sleeping as you do in school, but you... Probably. Anyway, so there's an idea that everybody is manipulating the education system and developing metrics and developing ways in which you can measure and uh, initiate um, the forms of education that seem appropriate. Isn't it dumb that we don't learn how to make stuff or learn about environmental systems? And, you know, in all of our education, we can talk about the third world, well, our law of thermodynamics. You know, if, if there, Whatever choices, you know, I'd say that's a system that I can't begin to address, right? And I have tried, and I have developed curricula, and I do. But so I would actually rather address teachers, not as teachers, but as people. And I certainly have many people come to, many impatient people who are teachers, um, who come to the clinic and co-develop prescriptions and protocols and experiments that they can do I certainly have a lot of um, three or four schools that are doing, signed up to do solar chimneys at the moment. But it's, it's certainly their problem to figure out how they get it past the school superintendent to put a big plastic bag on the school that might obscure the thing. And what if it falls down and suffocates 15 children and they, you know, all the kind of strange disaster scenarios that they have to deal with that I just, it's just a very, very, very highly constrained system. And I think that the, the focus that many um, philanthropic organizations have had on that have, have uh, none have made the job of teaching easier. None have made, um, certainly our mayor here. What's he doing telling the teachers, evaluating teachers? I mean, what the hell is the mayor doing? And he is, right? Pierce 41 here, my, you know, the third grade teacher. You know, her teaching and her salary is being, uh, you know, it's just lunacy. Um, so there's a kind of there's a lot of complexity in the school system that make it a very difficult genre, um, area within which and it's basically the U.S. public school system um, that I'm talking about here. So I would say let's get the focus off manipulating teachers. Leave them alone. Right? They're autonomous people who can make uh, intelligent judgments given their autonomy. And let's address them as people, as part of a collective sense-making community, as opposed to um, the further. The Cloud Institute is one very, very influential, doing very good work. And you know there are many organizations that do that. But I think as young designers, it's very hard to work within the school system um, 
to achieve any measurable change. I'd probably address a slightly different part of the question, which is about this of the oligarchy, the, the philanthropy side of things for, for making change. Um, I like the fact that they're often Gates, for instance, is often asking different kinds of questions, is at least purported to be much more evidence-based about those questions. So uh, in theory, at least, it should be that they're paying more attention and doing more sense-making and doing more um, experimentation, many of them talk about as well, trying different approaches. I don't always, I mean, I don't have purview over everything, right? But I, I sometimes question whether or not that's really happening. Um, the, one of the things that I think would make a real difference and it's to some extent coming out of some of the philanthropists or just trying different approaches um, I don't quite know how this ties into the question I had it in my mind a little while ago so I'm sure it will come out again <laughs> um, is uh, the participatory sort of encouragement of participatory processes and it's often given lip service by development agencies, consultation by school systems or, or even by foundations like Gates or various other, other ones. And one of the things I'm really interested in, the kinds of systems we're talking about, is that there's some opportunities to encourage really different kinds of conversations and boundary crossing just by running different kinds of exercises, by doing different kinds of, I won't call them experiments, but showing different kinds of opportunities. So uh, the group, the Red Cross Climate Center and the Parsons, various students at Parsons and lecturers at Parsons, um, designed a game that was played in uh, Senegal late last year for sort of teaching climate change. It actually wasn't even teaching climate change. It was uh, teaching, it was, start, it was to kickstart a conversation between scientists and meteorologists and um, the, effectively the disaster managers from the Red Cross in Senegal and other parts of Africa. And the goal was that the scientists are talking this, um, that there's a 30% chance of probability in the fifth quintile in the next 35 day period, etc. right? And these people are saying, do I tell this village to evacuate? Do I put more resources now into doing something differently? And that's a conversation that was going like this, and it's the same conversation we're talking about with scientists about climate change in other areas, about uh, endocrine disruptors, about all kinds of different things. And it was a really, uh, it turned out, fortunately it turned out really well as a game designed to stimulate and kickstart that conversation. But even better was it was designed also to then be taken and translated into a local community, not in the capital, but a Wolof speaking community, which is massively affected by climate change in terms of the frequency and occurrence of uh, floods and significant surges and extreme weather events. And about them participating and having that conversation about what it meant to them, about what these different conversations meant to them. And not to say that one thing can be everything to everyone, but just that there's a role to play in stimulating those conversations in games and play itself, uh, doing things differently. So learning outside of the school system, as you said, or being co-opted in different ways. Um, I don't know whether, I agree with you about the making side of things in schools, but I think there's perhaps a slight avenue in terms of the play aspect that's being co-opted in different ways for teaching, to teach different kinds of things, not the, what's expected. I'm actually going to um, wrap things up, I think, and we'll go from a centralized communication model to a distributed one. Um, and um, there are drinks and some uh, things to eat over there. I hope that you'll join us for that and uh, also um, give a big round of applause to our two Australian geniuses. <laughs> <laughs>